Fabulous. I, Thank you. you know, even at the New York Film Festival, they didn't give me flowers. Uh, so, you know, uh, for me, this is kind of historic in a sense uh, because, I, because I have these gentlemen who are so accomplished, who I admire so much for the work that they've done over the years. And I'm so appreciative because their work contributed so much to the success of this film. Uh, it's just uh, they captured it in such a way that it resonated uh, out of the screen to, in, a, in, in an emotional way. They were close 
to the characters, physically close to the characters. They were feeling their energy and capturing it as it was happening in a way that uh, um, it, really, uh, it really was uh, really quite extraordinary to ultimately look at it in the edit room and see what they actually uh, captured on film. So, uh, so with that, I'm just going to sort of start the conversation as well. Um, you know, to, you know, start it off. So I'll let I'll let you take charge now. Sure. Well, again, I'd like to reiterate what George said. Thank you all for being here tonight. Um, it was a really special screening. Um, I'll begin with a few questions to each of you, and then we can hear from our audience. Um, but George, I'm wondering if you can perhaps start us off by talking about the origin of the film. Um, sort of going off of what you already mentioned, so much of what makes this film feel so alive and honest is the level of access you have to not just the, the movement's torchbearers, but to its rising stars and their families. Um, it always feels like there's a true trust between the crew and the, those of, who are on screen. Um, so could you talk, us, talk about how this film began for you and what your process was like gaining everyone's trust and well, I, I think that, uh, you know, uh, once you get the trust of Mother Smith and Thomas Dorsey, you know, you're in, totally. And the fact is that I really became part of that family, Mother Smith's family. And she became a collaborator in the process of making the film. She was the one that insisted, insisted that Keith, her, her son, her grandson, be in the film. She insisted that Zella be in the film. And I went along with it. And as a result of it, we have these incredible scenes. That because once I had them in the film, I had to create scenes for them. And they became wonderful scenes to capture. So Mother Smith was really a partner. And Thomas Dorsey was, uh, it was, uh, it, it, you know, it was just a question of being extremely sensitive and delicate with him and uh, to be able to uh, capture his story. But, you know, um, so, you know, but I'm curious to know, like, from your perspective, you know, when you were there and you were kind of arrived and you saw what the situation was, you know, how you felt about your access, you know, your ability to get close to the folks when you were filming them. Was that, is that something that you're accustomed to or was it unusual in this film? I mean, how did it kind of, how did you feel as, as, as cinematographers being able to access them in that way? <laughs> well, you had created the trust with the people, and they trusted us. And my earliest memories as a child, if I was going to tell this story, was my parents had a, a, a maid, and I used to go to church with her, her, her church. And I, I, I felt so comfortable in that when you offered me the film to collaborate with Don, and I, I, just, I just felt so comfortable in that situation because I, that was my earliest memories of, of being in Black Baptist Church in New Jersey. So it's just, it, well, you all say it's about trust, but this kind of filmmaking, especially cinema verite, it wasn't set up. George does incredible research with the people, so he knows the stories he's looking for, but he puts them in the sa a situation to let it happen. And so he has to trust us, we have to trust that the, that the performances are there. I, I think Don and I both came out of kind of the Maisel School of Cinematography, of, of being there in the moment, and that, that's what this film represents, the moment. And, the, these people were so in the moment and in their belief that they, there wasn't any question about our proximity to them. I, my heart is pounding so um, hard right now from the experience of seeing it again. And I, I, I remember Mother Smith's comment that these people were not doing it for show but out of belief. And I really feel that, I don't know about Ed, but I think a lot of us, um, as much as we uh, respect and love each other, we're very competitive too. And um, yet I, when I look at this, I see no 
competition at all. I see it not in the performers. I see their almost ecstatic joy when they watch the others um, perform. And I, I felt it when looking at, at Ed's work and looking at, at my work. And we both were really in the zone, I think. And um, it almost seems like something magic. And I, um, for a pretty unreligious person, I, I um, feel like I would, the terms I would use would be um, <laughs> pretty spiritual. I, um, and, and, I, and I think that George did do, he, I think George is not in the tradition of, of the Maisels as Ed and I were. He did a lot of, um, a lot of work and planning and, and set up scenes, but allowed us the freedom to work within them. And I think that's, it's an extra, the results are extraordinary. And I think they kind of defy, um, <laughs> for me, complete explanation. But it's a complete work, editing, directing, preconception, um, amazing. Sound was extraordinary. I mean, everything about it to me was, yeah. Well, I, I made sure that uh, since I wanted all the characters to be captured as part of the tapestry of the film, that I told Don that I want cutaways of the Barrett sisters, the O'Neill twins, Zella, and, uh, and Mother Smith, that I needed those, I didn't want general cutaways of the audience, I needed to constantly be integrating them into the story because they were the central characters. It didn't mean anything to cut away to anybody else. Those were the storytellers. It was a tribute to Mother Smith. You wanted to see her reaction to those people singing to her. So it, there was an emotional connection that was happening there that was set up for you to capture. And that, for me, was an essential element. And it's amazing that you did it with three cameras. And you really, I mean, I, I, when I look at it, I almost can't believe that three cameras capture that. And we had so many problems. We had lights blowing out, and we had problems with one camera, and we had so many problems that I thought it was a total disaster. You know, uh, but it was just quite extraordinary that ultimately what you really did end up capturing. And, uh, and then there's you know, these incredible moments. Uh, you know, Eddie's one of those uh, uh, cinematographers that and probably the only one I've ever worked with who wanted to wear headsets. Uh, he wanted to hear everything that was happening. Uh, and I think that I understood it because he was a part of the storytelling. He wanted to know what they were saying because he wanted to know where to point the camera. And that was really important for me. So when he is capturing something, uh, he's capturing it from the point of view of you know, taking this position to, to narratively tell that story of that scene. And they both did enter into scenes that were preconceived set up in a sense that they didn't have to find the story, the story was there. All they had to do was capture it with their artistry expertise because it was gonna happen in front of them. It was just a, it, because I made sure that that was gonna happen because that's my role as a director. I decided that my role as a director is when the cameras are rolling that something worthy of being filmed is happening. Otherwise, what am I there to do? You know, I, I, I can't hire somebody to sort of find the story. That's my role to find the story. And then I let them do their best work. And so, but it's an also an, a very important for me to understand the ultimate significance of the film because I had no idea, I started when I was 27 years old, I had no idea Really, the significance of what I was doing, the meaning of what I was doing, the true meaning of all these folks, the meaning with the, within the African American community, the church, all that stuff was totally intuitive. And I'm very interested in getting your perspective about why the film resonates in the way it does for the African American community. Because I've had, I had somebody approach me today that said that they've watched it a hundred times, wanted me to sign their DVD, and they said that they're going to keep watching it. <laughs> you, know, I, I, you know, and I've heard this over and over and over, and I want to understand, because every time I watch it, I see something different. 
every time I hear somebody speak of it with expertise in different areas, whether it's religion, whether it's African-American culture, whatever it is, I learned something that I didn't know because I don't have those insight, uh, insights. I didn't grow up in that. And I'd like to understand that a little bit. Well, let's start with the title. The title is Say Amen, Somebody. Amen. And so in a um, colloquial way, uh, a preacher will, will throw out something, a scripture or part of a sermon, and there will be no sound in the room. And so we are very accustomed in our culture that when I say that the Lord is good and his mercy endured throughout all generations, somebody will say, amen. amen. But if you say something that people might not necessarily agree with, then you've got to beg them to say or to respond. And so when I saw Dr. Dorsey say, say amen, somebody, and it was after the statement of people accusing his music of being juke ja, uh, joint, um, bar music or street music or worldly music, he says, no, this music is about the gospel and, and that is the power as unto salvation. And so whether you come to it from um, an artistic perspective or if you come to it from somebody just drug you there, the root of this music is the good news of Jesus Christ. Say amen, somebody. Bishop Ray, what, do you remember the first time yeah, you saw uh, the yes, film? Yes, yes, <laughs> yes, yes. When did you first see the film? I saw it probably, I don't know, I was at like a venue like this, and I was in Chicago um, probably like eight years ago I saw it. And then I saw it again this summer, and it, and it moved me in a different way this summer than it did the first time that I saw it, because I'm in a different place in my own journey. But the spirit of it never changed. I still, when I, when I saw it with, with, my, uh, with, with church people back in Chicago, there were people in the audience that were shouting, and they were clapping their hands, and they were singing along but the spirit of it is still there. So that lets me know as a Pentecostal bishop that the Holy Ghost is real and that you can see it. You can see, you can feel it, you can see people experiencing it and it's something that you can't deny. Some of us liking it to the hair standing up on, our, on the back of our necks or we got goosebumps or our chest got tight. That's a power. That's power. That's power. Well, I, I, you know, I really. Uh, Don't leave me out here hanging. <laughs> you know, I, I really felt like I was a vehicle for, their, for them to tell their story. That I was not trying to impose anything on them whatsoever. I just wanted to tell their story. And I became a voice for them. Didn't want to impose anything. Ultimately, uh, and I, uh, there's a purity to that, I think, in the end, because, um, because that became a principle of mine. So, uh, and I remain true to it throughout the whole process. So um, I'm glad that it resonates in that way, because I think had I have done something quite, done, done something different, I think it would not have been received in the way it has been. And I'm so appreciative that it will live on forever as a, as, a, as a way of going back in time to, a, in a, t to a, a time and a moment that existed when gospel music, those, those legends still were alive and you could go live with them for that time period that we filmed and have an experience with them and truly understand where they're coming from and the origins of their, their beliefs and their feelings. So it's, it's such a... Uh, so gratifying for me to, to have done that. Well, when I look, and we appreciate it, really, really, because when I look at it, and when I go, when I go to the convention, because I, I go to the convention every year in August, and I saw Mother Gentry um, preparing for communion, 
and they still do it just like that. They get, they get together on, on Sunday night about 11 o'clock and they close that room up and they drape it in white and they fast and they pray. And then we all come in on Monday at the opening of the convention and we have that, that experience where we're coming together, the community is still there and the spirit is there and everybody takes communion and all of the singers are anointed and it's just a very, very sacred, sacred time that I personally look forward to. This is my 11th convention and I just look forward to that time and her daughter, um, Mary Beth, still wears that red veil, the red uh, stole and the mothers are still there and the preachers are still anointing and every Monday at the opening of a convention they still sing Preci precious Lord so that's still happening you know for people with that belief system and I'm and I'm really grateful that it has been captured on film and that we can still have that coming together I think this is 87 years now and and Thomas this was the last convention that Thomas Dorsey wow. went to and so uh, we, we captured it. And, uh, and so uh, that, was, that must have been quite interesting to have been in his presence at that convention. Uh, Eddie, because you were kind of. Well, the, the, there's one scene that I fought with George about to keep in the film. <laughs> it's when he goes outside in the back and he talks to the birds. And I just thought it was so poetic. You can't explain what it means but it means everything. And for, for me, as a cinematographer, the, the, I'm always looking for images that express ideas that are nonverbal. And that, to me, was the essence of his spirit. And uh, anyway, I, and you should tell the story about us trying to get him to tell that story. Well, uh, by the way, I, I, he didn't have to fight with me to keep that. I, I love that scene. I'd seen him do that before, long before that happened and took many photographs of him actually doing it. So I wanted to capture that, but nonetheless, I respect the fact that you <laughs> forgot the story, so that's, that's not a problem. Uh, but uh, what was it, what were you, uh, no, oh, no, we're getting we're Thomas talking. Dorsey to tell the story about his wife, wife's uh, dying was very difficult because at that point he was a little incoherent. So we had, I, we, I just had to work with him and work with him and work with him to get that, and that story out. Technical reasons, said Nettie didn't die for technical reasons. Oh yeah, he said Nettie didn't die for technical reasons. We said keep doing it over for technical reasons. He said Nettie didn't die for technical reasons. <laughs> you know, it was just, you know, uh, but you know, it, all that matters is that we got it in the end. Yeah. Ultimately, I learned something from this incredible sound man that worked on this. And by the way, you commented about the sound. I made sure that every camera had a, had a sound man. Because I, was, I can't stand when films have no sound and they cut to people. People are talking, that are integral to the film. And it makes the film come alive when you hear Thomas Dorsey talking when he's walking down the aisle and those conversations that he's having or you're hearing Mother Smith respond or whatever it is. I wanted to be sure that we heard everything. And so, uh, so that, was, that was significant, and I also want to be sure that we recorded all the sound in 24 tracks so that the music really uh, could really uh, resonate. And, uh, because I felt ultimately that the film would, uh, would just stand out a lot more. But it was, the camera work was so ex ex exquisite as well. The quality, you know, I, you know, I couldn't have asked for anything better in terms of what you folks did, you know, to co make this film come alive. You know, I mean, I was just, you know, I was so young at the time and to have these masters work with me, I admire them so, so much. Don t was the first one to turn me on to, s to Japanese food, sushi. You know, I'd never had it before, he turned me on. And Eddie, you know, just, he just understood lighting and he hung all those lanterns and at the convention and you know he just he had such a beautiful way of working and it, you know it was also a communicating together it was just there was an ease I think of working together you know it's it's just an ease that made it 
it, it, it just work for everybody and be in sync and ultimately give a gift to the community, to all, to everybody, but I'm especially appreciative that it gives a gift to the African American community that they can have this, this film forever to re-experience this time and, and you know, not just, you know. So, George, I'll ask another question then we can open it up to the audience, but I am really curious to hear what your first meetings were like with Thomas Dorsey and Mother Smith. What types of conversations did you have? Well, it just so happens. Now, I was, I was gonna, I, I had seen James Cleveland. I went to visit him. And I, you know, I, I, for gospel music at the time, we're talking about the, the, the you know, the early 80s, no, the 79. There were a lot of ways, I could have made the film about anything. I didn't know what it was gonna be about, so I went and spent time with James Cleveland. I spent time with Claude Jeter of the Swan Silvertones. I didn't know whether it was gonna be about quartets, about choirs, about, I mean, I didn't know, I didn't know anything about gospel music, period. And I read a book by Tony Halbert called The Gospel Sound, and it, it talked about Thomas Dorsey, it talked about Mother Smith, it talked about the Barrett sisters, and it talked about other people like Claude Jeter and James Cleveland, but when I, the convention was being held in New York, and I had an opportunity to go there, and that's where I met Thomas Dorsey and Mother Smith, and they embraced me, especially Mother Smith. It's like, it was, a, it was like we immediately had a bond, and she, I, I went out to St. Louis and just started spending time with her and her family, and we came, became very, very close. And, uh, and then I met the Barrett sisters, naturally, and th then I, you know, I had to start creating a, creating a story and integ integrate the story and I learned something from a, an editor friend of mine who you know, Jay Freund, fine, very fine editor. He said he cut a film once where it was two different basketball teams and the problem with cutting it was they never come together. And he said it's so hard to structure the film. So I made sure that there was never gonna be a point in any film that I ever made that the characters didn't come together. So I, I, I wanted to structure that. That's why the Barrett sisters, the O'Neill twins are all there and you could always be cutting back to them. You know, they're always, it's, it just makes it much easier from the, from the point of telling a, a narrative story on an emotional level. Let's uh, open it up to the audience. Um, raise your hand and we have a mic that's going around. Uh, yes, way in the back. It, you, yep. Hi. Don't worry about it, that's <laughs> We can, why don't we give you a mic, just so everything's being recorded, so we'd love to hear, give you a mic too. And he's fast, these folks are really fast. But you can, yeah, here we go. There we go. Sure, so one of the reasons that I have to tell you is that um, I'm actually, I am from St. Louis, I was not at Antioch, but I've been to Antioch multiple times, I've been to Washington Tabernacle multiple times, and so first for you, I wanted to again speak to your question about why it is that this particular film resonates. This film was also made at a particular space and time when gospel music was actually the point of changing, when church, when what is affectionately known as the black church was also in a period of evolution into the 70s, early, early 80s. And you came in at the moment where you captured that legacy, because there was some turmoil about this, you saw about like, are women gonna be ordained, and you know, yada, 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 yada. But the essence of being able to capture that from generation to generation to generation, we have a combined legacy that is based on the anointing and an understanding that no matter where you fall in that time period, God is still on the throne. It is that piece that I think is one of the reasons that this film is so beloved. So I wanted to say that. But in light of all that, Bishop, my question is actually for you, because I am finding that now, as that evolution continues to happen, that there is um, lots of things that are happening from a more contemporary perspective. There is a resurgence of interest, I'm finding, sort of like in, in hymns and to a certain extent in anthems, spirituals, that a cappella experience. But this era, I feel like in churches and in other places, I am not seeing like 
nobody's talking about Rosetta Thorpe anymore. Like, it is great that we're bringing Willie Mae Fort Smith back, but that sweet spot, um, I feel, is getting um, bypassed in our canon. So um, I am just curious um, from your perspective, since you have a choir and are doing other things, what are your thoughts on that and how we continue to elevate this particular moment? Well, well, if you noticed, Thomas wrote his music. Dr. Dorsey wrote his music down. We can start right there. Yeah. And most I'm not gonna say all, lots of church musicians, especially the younger ones now, they don't read. True, true. And so, you know, they just, there is, there is, you know, and, and not to, girl, not to, <laughs> sorry. not to have it, you know, to be dogmented in any way, but, that level of music that Thomas Dorsey was presenting mm -hmm. to the world, that's not fool's music. You, you have to be able to read those mm -hmm. chord progressions and not just be able to play one, four, five, seven, one. Right. You have to be able to read that, that yes. music. Um, and uh, I think now more than ever, um, from the experiences that I have as I teach music, I teach at New York University, mm -hmm. I have my own choir, I'm a learned musician. I have a, a, an orchestral conducting background. But when I travel around now, I do bring those mu that music with me. I bring the precious Lord, I mm -hmm. bring the hymns, I bring the call and response, I bring all of those different types of experiences so that there is a learning that is starting to take place. It's just gonna take a little bit of time because it's, it's more lucrative to be able to hit the hottest thing that's on the radio now and the struggle is the education piece. Does that answer? That it answer? does. Okay. Thank you. Uh, we can take a, one or two more questions. There. Yes, sir. Thanks. Um, the impression from the movie is that these two figures, uh, Ms. Smith and, and Mr. Thornton, were really seminal in the gospel world of writing down and creating this kind of music. Were there other figures around the same time or even earlier that may have been even more seminal or more important? Or how do you pick these two as the ones that you wanted in this movie in order to have this feeling that you're watching the beginning of something which is extraordinary. You know, I, you know, I, I wasn't focused on uh, trying to, you know, tell a story that you know was about the, um, you know, the seminal characters that came before or anything like that. I wasn't taking it really from a kind of historical perspective in that regard or. I just wasn't thinking that way. I was, I was really thinking about telling a film about characters who lived the music, and and I f I chose these characters. I always choose characters because number one, they have to be great characters and have a, sc a story to tell, and I kind of base it on that. And I felt that Mother Smith and Thomas Dorsey were f extraordinary characters who had a great story to tell but they also were, were important historical figures and could, and that, that the history could, could come out of their experience. Um, and so I didn't, I, I wasn't looking at, at those kind of questions really. And I don't even know, I don't, I, I, if you asked me the history of gospel music and I had to comment about it, I wouldn't know. You would probably understand better than I. That's a good place to start. He's not called the father of gospel music because he lacks weight. Um, not, it's not just so much about the music, but if you look at what he did, he, he put a map together that allows this music to permeate the entire world. 
you know, the, 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 the National Convention of Gospel Chorus is built up of unions. There are unions and subdivisions of this convention all over the country. And so there's the Southeast Division, there's the Northeast Division. There's over 85 unions. So you take 85 unions and you spread them across the country. Not only was he the father of gospel music, but he put a model in place to make sure that this music lived on forever in small pockets all over the country. And so I think that's a great place to start. Sure, he had great contemporaries, but when you look at the story, the story is who has been able to preserve it. And then James Cleveland came behind him in a similar model. So now you have uh, chapters, you have unions and chapters of this music, you know, being sustained all over the, all over the world. So you're asking for me to give you a little, some of my tricks? Yes. As a director? I, you know. I, I, I can talk about that scene specifically. I, I, uh, uh, and Eddie, you, you arrived and I, I told you what the scene was going to be about, that Delois was going to be making breakfast for her husband. We had already filmed the other scene. And I knew that this was an ongoing problem, but I, there was no way I could wait till the conversation came up. So I arrived and they had already eaten breakfast. So I said, well, you're going to have to cook breakfast again. <laughs> And so I whispered in Frank's ear. I told him what the nature of the con I told him to ask a question, knowing that if he asked that question, that he would get a response. And then that response, it would just spark everything. I just gave him one little hint. And he was more than willing to do it because that he believed in it and he, he wanted to bring it up. And then Delois naturally responded the way she did. Uh, so that's how, actually how it happened. And the, and the so I want to compliment that? also the editing and the cinematography in that scene. Sorry? I, I really was, I want to compliment particularly in that scene, the way it was edited, the, the wonderful interplay of, of the exchange of glances between them was really very truthful. The exchange of, the exchange of what? Of glances. Oh, the yeah, well, she, when she realizes that she's caught, she looks at, she looks at me as she's turning towards the, She's turning towards Frank, and she gives me a look. <laughs> you know, and it gets a laugh when she gives me a look because it looks like she's giving the camera a look, but she's really giving me a look. <laughs> and then she goes for Frank and says, "You want eggs with your sausage?" Which is, right. I mean, is the most perfect line you could possibly <laughs> say to him at that point, because yeah, I had no, I didn't know he felt that that I, I didn't know the extent to which he wanted to have her not travel with her sisters. I didn't know. How, I didn't know that he was going to go that far. I had no idea. All I knew is, uh, as a director, all I need to do is plant the seed that needs to be planted to make something happen to the scene. That's what I do. You like the grandson and uh, Mother Smith? The grandson and no, the grandson and Mother Smith is different. I had no idea that he was going to come out with that stuff, and nor did Mother Smith. <laughs> no idea. That happened. Naturally, it was going to be a drive. Mother Smith said, I want Keith to go with me. That was a trip. He, Keith chose to bring that up. <laughs> I didn't know what was going to happen on the scene. But Eddie was positioned perfectly to capture that. I, in fact, I was sitting in the back there, and I could not believe what was happening. <laughs> and Mother Smith couldn't believe it because she really, genuinely, and you can feel it when she says it, I really didn't know you felt that way. Yeah. Yeah, that was visceral, and and I appreciate I appreciate those those two scenes being a woman in ministry, and being an, a woman in the episcopacy. So, I'm a, a bishop over pastors that are men that feel that way, and 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 members of my family also that feel that way. But when they call me to pray and I gotta cast out a demon, they don't see a woman; they see a warrior, and so. Um, being able to have them explore that in such a, a beautiful and loving and kind way um, because women do have a place in ministry, I believe, that's just my belief, because I'm here and I'm doing it. Um, and and, to, and have, to have that be a part of a movie that was, that was a long time ago, that, and it's still, it's still uh, uh, an, an issue today. And I'm, I appreciate the way that it was handled. I really, 
really well, I, appreciate that. My, I never, ever want to put anybody in a position that they're uncomfortable, that isn't true and real and genuine. Uh, so I'm very sensitive to that, and I would never ask Frank to do something that wasn't real for him and for their relationship. So I feel really strongly about that, and, and I've never crossed that border with people, and I think that it just shows as being something genuine and honest that people can relate to it's beautiful. and real. Um, do we have time for one more? Let's see. Film a quick one. All right, a very quick question, uh, if anyone has one. I felt all I saw was the problems. <laughs> That's all. I, I wasn't into, geez, this is amazing. No, not at all. Problems, How about the cinematographers? Oh, were okay. you caught up in watching it and just, or were you so sterile with just trying to get the shot, you weren't? No, no, t totally caught up in it, and, and, but not, but it created focus and concentration rather than the loss of control. I, I, I really feel that we were vehicles um, for, for the spirit that, that was expressed. So you did you. feel that you were onto something so powerful and that you were lucky enough to be in the vortex of it. I don't know about onto something. We were in it. Into in something, it. yeah. We were in it, that's in right. You. Thank that's you. Exactly right. Okay. George, Ed. Don Bishop Wright, thank you so much for being here. Thank you.